Causality 1. This is the second lecture in the research design course and the first lecture in a sequence of three on the topic of making causal inferences. A copy of the slides can be downloaded from the URL underneath the lecture title. This is an overview course and in these lectures I cover a lot of ground quite quickly. As in the rest of the course, my intention is to map out the field rather than tell you all that you need to know. For a more in-depth treatment, you will need to take a more specialised course, such as the optional course specifically on causality offered to students at Oxford pursuing the MSc in Sociology or the MPhil in Sociology and Demography. This lecture has three parts. In the first, I sketch some broad philosophical issues about what it means to make a causal inference. I then move on to talk about two broad views of causality, which have somewhat different implications for how we in practice proceed to making empirical causal inferences. In section two, I discuss the causes of effects view, and in section three, the effects of causes view. Throughout the three lectures on causality, most of the emphasis will be on the third effects of causes view. It would be wrong to give the impression that making causal inferences is what sociologists spend all their time doing. In my opinion it would also be wrong to say that making causal inferences is the only thing that a social scientist should do. A lot of good social science is descriptive and none the worse for that and it should be obvious that before we attempt a causal explanation of something, we must first have confidence that we have accurately described the facts of the matter. This, in itself, is no easy task. Nothing that I say over the next three lectures should be taken to imply the denigration of good quality descriptive work. There are, however, many instances when our intellectual project does explicitly involve the making of causal inferences, and many more where the language of effects is freely used. This implies some sort of causal narrative, even if the machinery that would warrant a causal claim is not obviously present. The idea that causes are what we are after has a long history. The first school of social science in the UK, the London School of Economics and Political Science, made a nod back to Virgil's Georgics when it took as its motto, rerum cognoscere causas, to understand the causes of things. The English poet John Dryden gives a charming, though non-literal, translation of Virgil's line, Felix qui potuit rerum cognoscere causas, as happy the man who studying nature's laws through known effects, can trace the secret cause. But what are causes? The Scottish philosopher David Hume pointed out that when we, for instance, consider two physical objects colliding and say that one has caused the other to move, we don't actually observe the causal connection we're talking about. What we observe is that one billiard ball has hit another and the second has moved. We infer that the second's movement is because of the impact of the first because every time we see one ball hit another the second moves and this is the observation of that constant conjunction that leads us to infer causality. Immanuel Kant also wrestled with what he thought of as Hume's problem and reached the conclusion that thinking in causal terms was in essence part of the nature of the human condition, in the sense that the concept of causation was hardwired into the architecture of the mind. For Kant, it was literally and unavoidably part of our way of seeing the world. Though the thoughts of Hume and Kant are fascinating, I'm not, thankfully, delivering a course on the philosophy of science, so at this point we can wave goodbye to both of them. However, what we gain from having introduced them in the first place is the distinction between the actual causal process, which is part of the physical, 
or in our case, the social world we are trying to explain, and the inferences that we make about them. In a substantive investigation, it's the former that is of interest. We want to learn about the world. Learning how to make valid or credible inferences about the substance of causes is the methodological interest. Hume and Kant both have valuable lessons to teach us. Causal inference is in the head, but the causal processes that we seek to uncover are in the world and are independent of the observer's mind. They are what they are, regardless of what we may think about them. As the science fiction writer Philip K. Dick put it, reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. At the heart of making a causal inference is understanding of the reasons for variation. On the one hand, we have variation in the things we want to explain, the explanandum. Some patients live and others die. Some kids pass their exams while others don't. Some citizens vote for the government and others for the opposition. On the other hand, and no less important, we have variation in the values that the explanatory variable or variables, the explanants, can take. Patients have more or less severe symptoms. Some kids have private tutors and others don't. Some voters have positive evaluations of the government's competence and others think that they're fools. We'll take variation in the explanandum for granted. In other words, I'll set aside here the problem of how to give a causal account of a constant and focus on cases where we have variation in the values that the independent variable takes. The first question we have to ask is, how is that variation generated? There are two possibilities. The first is that it could be generated by the intervention of an observer. For example, in an educational study, a researcher might assign half the students to a new French language learning method and the other half to the old tried and trusted method. After six months, they might then test both groups and observe which has the highest test score. If the assignment of subjects to groups was random, we might talk about this being an experiment. The second source of variation might be nature itself which is a succinct way of saying that the social scientist takes things as they come, observes social processes as they play themselves out, and as an observer, does nothing except passively record the outcomes and the initial conditions. Of course, nature can work in many ways. Sometimes, nature does a fair job of mimicking a randomized experiment. For example, the American draft during the Vietnam War was a lottery, with birth date dictating how soon you would be called up. This means that if we want to study the impact of military service on later adult life outcomes, for example earnings, we can treat military service as approximating an exogenous experimental intervention which divides the population at random into one group that served and another that didn't. Though sometimes she comes up trumps, nature usually isn't quite so generous. If we're lucky, she might arrange things so that the outcome we are interested in depends only on things that we have observed. For example, the standard face sheet variables, age, gender, ethnicity, education, marital status, and so forth. Things that are routinely recorded in social survey investigations. If we're unlucky, she might also arrange it so that our response variable depends on factors that could have been observed, but in fact were not, so-called missing variables. Sometimes these will be things that we could not even have imagined were relevant. Sometimes they will be things that are just very difficult to capture because they consist of private information available to the person concerned, but not to the external observer. 
Perhaps to the personal concerned, this information is only barely recognized. For example, when people choose to join or forbear from joining a job training program based on their expectations about how the program will in the future most likely benefit them. The point to take away from this is that when you try to say something quantitative about causation, the meaning of the numbers you estimate and their relevance to a causal inference will depend on the answers you can give to the questions enumerated on the slide. In the context of empirical investigations, it's useful, at least for the purposes of exposition, to distinguish between two different types of intellectual project. Right now, I'm going to emphasize the differences between them, but you should not read this as an argument to the effect that these different ways of doing causality are fundamentally at odds. I don't believe this to be the case, and in fact later I will suggest that as parts of a more general scientific research program, they are in fact quite complementary. But for the moment, I want to distinguish between views of causality that focus on the causes of effects and views that focus on the effects of causes. Most of what I have to say over the next three lectures is about the latter, but I'll begin with the former and get it out of the way. In what I've called the causes of effects enterprise, the objective is to start with a known regularity a set of events, behaviour, or an occurrence, and ask, what are the causes of the thing we're interested in? We usually assume that causation is not reducible to identifying a single causal factor, and that we are therefore playing a game of hunting the causes. <laughs> 